Hey guys, welcome back to Ostrich Investing, where our goal is to educate and debate specific stock investment ideas. Today we're going to talk about American Tower. It's a U.S. REIT, but it doesn't own traditional bricks and mortar. Instead, American Tower owns and operates wireless towers globally to provide cell coverage. So if you're watching this video on your phone, maybe the signal is passing through one of their towers. I thought it was interesting, and apparently those of you who voted for this one did too, uh, because the company has had really strong growth driven by industry fundamentals as well as successful acquisitions. But it's not cheap. It's trading at over 50 times 2019 earnings per share and 26 times AFFO, which is more typical valuation metric for REITs. It also has a dividend yield of 1.8%. It's also not a traditional business model I was familiar with, so I was curious to learn more. If you like these videos, Tell a friend about the channel so we can continue to build and grow the community. Also, leave comments with ideas for videos you want to see next, and I can add it to the growing list. Okay, let's jump into it. So we'll start with, let me just get it here, uh, a review of the business model and American Tower in general. And just a note, American Tower has some great investor presentations on their investor relations website, and that's where I pulled a lot of this content from. Uh, so as it tells you here, and picture tells a thousand words, they have a bunch of these sites globally that uh, provide wireless towers for their customers. And you can see a typical arrangement between American Tower and their tenants is that American Tower operates the tower structure itself, so the big structure here. Um, and the land parcel, which is either owned or operated uh, on a long-term lease. The tenants themselves basically rent space on the tower and then on the ground, surrounding ground to, to uh, contain equipment, HVAC, and, and other equipment that they need. So the tenants themselves provide a lot of the equipment that goes on the structure. Uh, American Tower is providing the real estate necessary for today's wireless communications networks. So a little bit about wireless tower basics. Again, this is all in, in the presentations on their, their website. So they say it's a vertical tower built on a parcel of land designed to accommodate multiple tenants. And that's a key piece here is that they can have more than one customer on each tower. Uh, tenants, again, lease the vertical space on the tower and portions of the land underneath for their equipment. So what's found, um, you know, this is a lot of this is just is just repeat. So we won't we won't go through it. We'll just jump right to the next to the next slide. Types of towers, uh, so different types of towers. There's the monopole, the lattice, the guide, and then this one's interesting too. Stealth, particularly in urban areas, there's ways of putting this equipment on top of buildings in urban in centers that if you if you walked by quickly, you probably wouldn't even notice uh, they were there. So those are the different types of towers. So a summary of American Towers portfolio: uh, pretty global, operate in 17 countries, over 5,000 employees and 171,000 communication sites. So if you think about the value prop to their customers, um, they could, you know, their customers being wireless carriers, for example, could try and build out a network on their own, or uh, they could come to American Tower that already has, you know, thousands of towers set up across um, their, their network area. And it's sort of a one-stop shop. So here you can see in the US, they've got 40,000 towers internationally 129,000 and some distributed antenna systems. Now let's jump into the industry fundamentals which are very attractive uh, for American Tower. So the industry and it's going to come as no surprise to you again you're probably watching this on your phone we are we are helping their business as we speak. Um, so you can see the total mobile connected devices in the US over uh, projected from 2018 through to 2024 is projected to grow at 7% a year. So just the number of mobile phones out there is projected to grow at 7%. The second key point, as we continue to do more data intensive activities on our phone, so Netflix and Hulu, for example, are 11,000 times as data intensive as sending an email. Sounds obvious. Um, you've got YouTube here in the middle, but the more of the, the higher bandwidth stuff that we're doing increases um, the need for data consumption. So if you put both of those things together, you've got average data usage per device. And sorry, we're not putting both of those together. Average data usage per device is 
is expected to grow at a 29% CAGR over uh, the next few years. So combining a 7% device growth with a 29% uh, data traffic growth, you can see that the need for wireless towers and network coverage um, is, is going to continue to grow in the future. And that's you know, about as strong industry fundamentals as you're going you're gonna to see in an opportunity. So a uh, huge check mark here. Now we look at the stock price performance over the last five years, um, and you can see that the stock price was a little over or under $100 about five years ago, and it's, it's exhibited uh, what I would call the Drake or Drizzy pattern that started from the bottom now we hear. It's been a nice, nice trajectory for investors uh, up at a little over $200 uh, today. You can see in May 2019, they announced an agreement to acquire Eaton Towers, which is five and a half thousand sites across Africa for $1.85 billion. And we mentioned that before. They've had good organic growth, but they've also been able to complete several acquisitions. And this is a quick review of their history. I won't go through all of it, and it's probably way too small on your screen, uh, but you can find it in one of the investor presentations. It, it, it was founded as a subsidiary of American Radio way back in 1995. So this is a business that's been around for a long time. And each one of these is either organic growth into a new country or acquisition. Um, so you can see that they do have a long track record of, of growing the business. And then quickly here, just a reminder, currently trading 1.8% dividend yield, 54 times PE, that's 2019 estimated PE, and 26 times available funds from operations. Uh, and that's based on co company guidance. So if we look at the financials, with the industry backdrop and the execution that we talked about before, no surprise here, there's some really solid numbers historically. So if you look at uh, property segment revenue and adjusted EBITDA, both are growing at about 16% a year, uh, and that's over a 10-year period. And when you look at these charts, sometimes keggers can be misleading because you know maybe the, the period where they start have just happened to be a low point, but you can see pretty strong steady growth through the um, through the period. Consolidated available funds from operations also growing at 16% CAGR. And here, uh, you know, shout out to the management team. They've also included the per share CAGR of 16%. So just slightly lower. When you have a company growing this quickly, the obvious question is, uh, have they had to dilute shareholders a ton? And in this case, they, they haven't. Um, so the per share AFFO is growing really strongly. Um, and then the last point that I'll touch on here is return on investment capital. So you can see that they've kept it, uh, they've kept it at about 10%, just over, it's peaked up to over 11% uh, in 2018. And we're going to talk about uh, that a little bit later in, in one of the key elements of, of, uh, of the business model, which is having multiple ten tenants on a tower. And that really drives the return on invested capital. Net debt is about $20 billion, and the book equity is $5 billion. So market cap of over $90 billion relative to the book equity. This is not a traditional uh, value play in terms of multiple of book value, but it, really impressive to see the business that they've built uh, with a book value of $5 billion. Customers. So here's where we start to dissect the business model. And I think... It's probably obvious, and especially now that you see it on the on the the page, you know one of the potential weaknesses of the business model is they're not going to have many customers. They're going to have a few really big customers. So you can see it here: AT and T, Verizon, Sprint. Probably no surprise, but they account for a large part of um, American Towers' revenue. And obviously, on the international side, they're going to have other other players. So while they've got great blue chip customers. Um, the business is going to be relatively concentrated with a few number of, of customers. And again, that'll, that'll feed into some of our discussion later as well. The other thing they talk about is their, their global tenant lease renewal schedule. So most of these are on long-term contracts. Okay, so now let's talk about the economics and, and having one, two, or three tenants on the tower. So this is basic uh, Sesame Street type math here. We got one, we've got two tenants, we've got three tenants, 
but sometimes again pictures uh, can tell the story and the cost to American Tower to have the land and the tower in place are pretty much the same constant and if they're able to add additional tenants uh, then obviously all of that additional re revenue flows right through uh, to the bottom line. And we see it on the next slide here and again it's going to be a little small on your screen but you can check out the investor presentation on their their website. This is how it flows through so they actually give you the figures of of what they expect the cost to be um, and the return on investment for a tower when there's just one tenant is three percent so quite low but when they can get two tenants the return on investment quickly jumps to 13 percent and then at three tenants it's 24 percent so there's a ton of operating leverage here if they can add additional customers to their towers and again compare that back to their overall return on invested capital of about 11 percent in 2018 so you can get a sense that they probably don't have too many towers that have three and they probably have a good mix of one and two tenant towers reconciliation okay uh, there's a lot on this slide um, sorry not sorry we're going to walk through just the reconciliation between earnings per share $2.77 in 2018 and available funds from operations which was $7.99 in 2018. So whenever you know you think about available funds from operations it's going to add back non-cash expenses like depreciation. So you'd always expect it to be higher um, but when it's this big of a delta I thought it was worth jumping into the financial statements and just working through the reconciliation. So they provide that to you on page 36 of the 10k. There's a couple of the items that are obvious. Again, the, the depreciation here in, in 2018 was 1.9 billion, but there's a few items that I just wanted to point out. It, there's a lot of items here that they're reconciling and, and adding back, and I think it is important to take management guidance at their word on the one hand, but then also just dive into the 10K and make sure that you understand the adjustments being made and make sure that you agree with them. So here, uh, this one really stood out to me. Losses from the sale or disposal of real estate and real estate related impairment charges. So when I jumped into the notes in the statement uh, and it says down here and I won't read the whole thing but the company will impair towers when those towers don't have any tenants or when they have expenses in excess of revenue. So if you think about 140,000 tower sites some of them might just not be in the right areas. Maybe it had one customer and that customer left for some reason. Um, so they're going to have impairment charges from year to year where they say, look, that, that tower uh, cost us a certain amount of capital. It's sitting on our books on property um, a, at a certain level and we're going to impair that. So while they're right that it's non-cash, uh, obviously there was capital expenditure that at some point went to build out those towers and I didn't do a huge look back over time but it does look to be an amount that's recurring from year to year. So again that's one where I'd, I'd probably challenge management a little bit whether that's a true add back. Obviously if it's going to be recurring then it's not a true a true add back. But 479, 480 million of, of impairment uh, type charges in 2018 so that one's material. Stock-based comp of course they're they're adding back which again it, it is non-cash but uh, you as a shareholder uh, it does come with a cost so there's no question about it. Stock-based comp was 137 million. Uh, other operating expenses a lot of one-time items, M&A advisory fees etc, consulting fees okay that is that is real cash um, but uh, supposedly one time in nature but again for a business like this they are spending amounts in in that area each year uh, so it gets a little tougher to make the argument for the one time adjustment again you get all the growth that comes with the M&A advice uh, and the M&A transactions um, but you you know there is some friction cost there and I, I don't think it's fully fair just to completely ignore those and then capital improvement and capital expenditures that's the other piece of the story they go into it in more detail. We're not going to focus on it in our presentation other than to say their capital expenditures in the cash flow statement are significantly higher 
than what's highlighted here. What's highlighted here is what they deem to be the maintenance capital expenditures. So the amount of capital required just to maintain their existing portfolio, any work on the towers themselves. Um, so just another point to, to make. So you go from net income of 1.3 billion and you end up with uh, available funds from operations of 3.2 billion. So again, just, just interesting. And I wanted to uh, point out the and walk through the reconciliation. And then lastly, we talked about valuation at the beginning. Are there other comparables out there? I didn't do an ex exhaustive search, but I've, I've definitely heard of at least one, which is Crown Castle. Um, American Tower has 171,000 sites. Crown Castle has 40,000. But they do have, I think, a larger fiber network. Uh, market cap for American Tower is $95 billion. Crown Castle is about 55, so American Tower being bigger. Enterprise value 125 versus 80. And then on the valuation, I just wanted a benchmark um, for what it's worth. And 26 times AFFO based on company's guidance for 2019, which is $8.32. And 23 times uh, Crown Castle's 2019 guidance of 592. Uh, so companies that are, are, are not cheap, but obviously have uh, pretty strong growth embedded in them. So now key considerations, we'll jump into the key considerations uh, for American Tower. So what do we know? For sure, they're strong, and I put the bicep emoji here, super strong tailwinds in, in data usage growth. So if you think about an industry or a macro backdrop, it doesn't get much better than this. Uh, demand for network strength increase the need for additional network sites and coverage. So I think as we consume more data, uh, you're going to want to make sure that the economics are going to be there, the need's going to be there to make sure there's super strong signal strength everywhere, which should ostensibly increase the need for either additional towers or more customers on each tower as they build out each, each customer, each wireless carrier build, builds out their network. Wireless provider competition drives AMT business model and economics. So one of the key points here is more competitors, more wireless carriers is good for American Tower um, because they'll end up with multiple customers on each tower. And as we saw before, that drives your return on invested capital. So if you were looking at a bull case scenario here, you would be thinking that they're going to increase the number of customers per tower. And an increase in competition amongst wireless carriers would, would help with that. And then another big strength is the contracted revenue, uh, five to 10 year terms with renewals. Um, and so uh, lots of visibility on the revenue side. Risks, technological disruption. They talk a little bit about that in, in some of their presentations. I didn't do a deep dive on this. It's not my area of expertise, but obviously right now, um, this tower coverage uh, is, is the way to go. Um, there are other, are other potential uh, technologies that could, down the line, potentially disrupt the business model. Um, and so that's something you just want to be comfortable with as an investor. Number two, competition. So they're not the only game in town. They do have a pretty good head start and they've got a lot of assets. Uh, but Crown Castle's out there doing this. Brookfield, interesting. Uh, Bruce Flat mentioned on, on uh, one of his recent investor calls, I believe, that Brookfield was looking at getting into this area and sees some really attractive returns. So on the one hand, that's a great validation of American Tower's business model. On the other hand, uh, Brookfield has a lot of money and could be quite a formidable competitor. And when you hear about competitors looking at coming into the space, obviously, uh, all else being equal, that's probably going to drive down returns over time. So again, just something to keep in mind. Uh, number three. Wireless providers build out their own network or consolidation of wireless providers. So again, the flip side to the strength of having increased competition from wireless providers, the opposite could be true. So you have to sort of take a view as an investor as to what you think is going to play out. And obviously, I don't think this first one is likely that they're going to want to build out their, no, their, their own network. Um, that's pretty capital intensive to do. Um, so it's probably more likely that they would they would stick with a provider like American Tower if, oh, if they could, but the consolidation of wireless providers would be would be a huge risk here because again those economics really really turn when you've got multiple tenants on on one tower and so the fewer wireless carriers there are out there, 
the, the fewer instances where that will be the case. And the fourth one, which we didn't talk about up until now, but when you go through their documents, less than 30% of the land uh, underneath their towers is actually owned by American Tower. And for me, this is a, maybe just thinking about this as a traditional REIT. You, you expect that they own, you, they own the real estate, they own the land. Um, and that's not necessarily, the, that's not the case here. Um, so less than 30% of the, the land underneath the towers is owned by American Tower. The rest of it is is under sort of long term long term leases, and, and they've got access to it. Um, but I put here as a key risk the ability to renew those leases on on favorable terms. Okay, key drivers. So mobile adoption and data usage usage go globally. We walk through some of the stats in the industry slide. Number two, customers per tower. Uh, we talked about that a few times. Growth and maintenance capex obviously is going to be uh, is going to drain your your cash flow, um, and then fourth is acquisitions. Um, their ability to complement the organic growth historically as with acquisitions as well. If you can get both of those things, that's a pretty powerful growth story. So, in conclusion, I think this is a business that has great growth historically, and in the absence of significant technological disruption. Expect a good runway of growth moving forward. I think the question for investors is really about valuation. Uh, is future AFFO growth going to continue in the mid-teens, or will it settle into the high single digits? And we know ROIC and the number of customers per tower will be a key part of the story. Let me know what you think. What's the biggest risk uh, to the growth story in your mind? We'll be back soon with more content, but until then, happy investing, and don't bury your head in the sand.